identified the deficiency as being shock, it identified the problem as being pre-hospital and emergency department, it decided that the best, the things that would make, might make a difference would be to improve communication within the hospital, having surgeons around at the right times for good decision making for operating theatre and having a good orientation program for those junior doctors that are coming every three to six months. And then closing the loop, which means, did it work? Did all of this work? Well, the mortality, the preventable mortality, decreased from 6% to 4.5%. So at least a 25%, if not a third percent reduction in mortality in a relatively short time. With 20 data elements, you can have a trauma registry in Uganda. With 18 data elements, you can have a trauma registry in Haiti. So it doesn't have to be complex. It needs funding and resources, but it doesn't have to be too complex. And in Uganda, for example, where even though the severity of injury using their local score increased in terms of percentage of the injured patients, the mortality went from 7% to less than 3% in a seven year period. But registries remain, and this is data now from, and slightly dated from 2010, registry remain predominantly in North America, UK, Germany, some have been done as research projects short term in Iran, uh, Australia, New Zealand and are on the growth elsewhere as we can see here. This is a measure of trauma registry publications over time. So they're increasing the activity but not enough and not enough to, cap to measure the burden where the burden of injury is greatest, for example, India. So it's not just in sporadic countries that this is being looked at, it's the WHO thinks it's really important. So the WHO uh, have had guidelines in the past 15 years ago on injury surveillance, which covers demographics and injury mechanism. They've got guidelines three years ago on dead people. So the other end, one type of outcome, but they do not, these guidelines do not guide us how to measure processes of care, time for certain events, and severity of injury, which is important for risk adjusting. So when we're looking at a minimum data set for any trauma registry, regardless of resources of the country, or when WHO is looking at a global minimum data set that it thinks we might be able to measure anywhere in the world to improve trauma care, then it needs to be useful, but it needs to be feasible. And that's the balance that's very, very important. At this point in time, and we're maybe six months from this being a formalised minimum data set, but it will look something like this. Uh, there are some familiar players there. This would be the core minimum data set of 33 uh, data items that we think would be important for any trauma registry anywhere in the world to meet the aims of some epidemiology, some prevention, some advocacy, and importantly, quality improvement in trauma care. And then there will be some option, optional items that are difficult to collect that uh, individual centre may find uh, are very useful for them and very feasible for them. So I've almost finished, but I just want to talk about a, so a recent study that was done that looked at the lessons of those, particularly both in low and middle income countries and high income countries, what was really, really important uh, for a trauma registry to be successful and sustainable was to not aim too high, but to start simple and work up, keep it really, really, really basic to begin with, collect something, create a culture of data, get the questions from the clinicians in the Trauma Quality Improvement Program and respond to those and gradually build up maintaining good quality of data as you go. And these were some quotations from some uh, key trauma care stakeholders, particularly in developing or low and middle income countries. So in conclusion, for a trauma system to reduce deaths and disability, then there must be a trauma quality improvement program, national, state and hospital level. And it should be informed by a trauma registry of data, that is, on trauma, national, state, hospital level. The needs being identified in countries, regardless of their resources, and by the governing body for health being WHO. So we know that trauma registries are feasible, Simple trauma registries can inform improvements in trauma care and simple trauma registries can reduce death and disability from injury. Thanks very much.
you the letter up, then the, uh, the, some question will allow for the discussion from the professor. Is there any question? Yeah. If you think any of the hospitals in India is going to start a trauma registry, uh, which of the three parameters you would think that they should measure? Just having had the, so much of experience, <laughs> what are the three key things you think we should measure? Death, uh, number of injuries, so you've got a numerator and a denominator. And, uh, and I'll put all the rest into the third group. <laughs> Severity, but I, I, se severity would definitely be the third one. It's difficult to measure, so it, it can break the confidence of a registry that's trying to start. If they send everybody off to get AIS coding training, uh, so some measure of severity is important. So that might be, for example, Glasgow Coma Score on arrival. That that might be might be something, or it might be some other anatomical measure at, at AIS at post mortem. That, but that requires formalised training and adds to the cost of what you're trying to achieve. That's a great question. I've never heard that question before. Thank you. So, is there any other question? Yeah. How do you think... Um, obviously, it was wonderful talk. Undoubtedly, matchless. <laughs> well, <laughs> then I want to put few things. Uh, do you think it can produce some medical science out of it in order to uh, promote the rehabilitation programs, particularly long terms, in terms of not only physical re rehabilitation, but for, you know, because many of these patients pass into the psychological derangements and depression and frustration, tension, stress level goes up. So, can your database help in bringing up that kind of science? It can certainly measure it, and by measuring it, it gives it a chance for us to know whether things might improve it. Uh, rehabilitation is really difficult, and uh, dealing with disability, I think one of the greatest fears uh, is still with patients is that uh, whilst we might intubate the severe head injury now, we're going to leave somebody uh, with a disability yeah, in a low-resource environment where it's left to the family to look after this person who used to be the provider. It's a, it's a great fear. So it's a really important question to, to, to uh, have an intervention on. We don't know what the intervention is. We've gone very simple with this particular collaboration. We're looking at a... Keith Willett's idea, largely, it was a, of, of the UK trauma system, the London trauma system, was a script of some sort. And then uh, using the wonderful mobile phone technology... Uh, in India to see whether that might work. So it remains to be seen and that is just on lower limb orthopedic injuries because walking, measure of walking or not can, is a lot easier than measuring uh, mental illness which is what you've described. That is very, very difficult and will take some time. Thank you. Now we have next speaker, Dr. S. Raja Swaboti. He is uh, at the moment uh, working as Chairman, Department of Plastic Surgery and Microsurgery and Bones at Ganga Hospital, Coimbatore, and also Director of the Ganga Hospital. He is an adjunct professor also in Tamil Nadu, Dr. MGR Medical University. He will be delivering a talk on making a difference in trauma outcomes by teaching and training. Dr. Mr. Chairpersons, Mr. Srinivas, uh, Amit, Sushma and uh, dear, my dear friends. Uh, I thank uh, Professor Mishra and team for giving me this opportunity to be again at AIMS. I always like this place. And the topic that I have chosen is to how we could make a difference in the trauma outcomes by, by teaching and training. And many of you are from abroad, so I like to say to where, where I am from. I am from a <coughs> city called Coimbatore. Uh, it's in uh, South India. The New Delhi is here. I think Coimbatore is here, very close to Kerala. And it's a city of 1.5 million people. 
by Indian standards is a small city. So it's a tight to city and though it's small, it's called as a Manchester, South India because a lot of uh, textile mills are there. And we don't assemble cars, but uh, if we find any car that is running on uh, roads in India, 10% of the car is made in Coimbatore. We, made, we make a lot of uh, automotive uh, uh, ancillaries, we make, uh, so it's an industrial city and now it's becoming a good educational hub and a healthcare uh, population. That's the hospital I come from, that's the Ganga Hospital, is our hospital. It's a hospital for uh, uh, two specialties, there is uh, plastic regenerative surgery and orthopedics. It's a 480 bedded facility uh, for its two specialties and we mainly deal with trauma. And in 2014, we had uh, 16,500 major surgical procedures, trauma. To give an idea of the type of major injuries we treat, not the fractures, we, uh, we had uh, 850 open fractures uh, last year. So it's, it's a very busy place. So more than that, uh, we like to we have become a sort of a, a resource place for uh, training in trauma reconstruction. But then if you have to become a resource place for trauma reconstruction, you need to get these patients primarily. I think that's the point. We don't get them primarily, you can't reconstruct them. And then unless your primary care is good, reconstruction can't be good. So gradually it evolved that uh, we also start evolving a good primary care. I think that's what our idea was. And uh, we're also happy that about more than 100 surgeons visit us a year, visit the department. And last 2014, we had 132 surgeons uh, visiting, visiting our uh, unit. So now the, coming to the problem, I think the problem has been well told throughout the morning. In the latest issue of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, I think the cover page was this. I was trying to find a figure out what this page meant. I think it's the, it's the world map put into five and it says five billion. I think five billion is the people who, are, who are, don't have good access to surgical care. I think that was the, that was the, but I thought it was a very fitting thing for our uh, meeting. This is just the latest issue of the, the bulletin of the Royal College of Edinburgh. And the key article in that was, uh, they said there is a tremendous amount of uh, care imbalance. And what we really need to do is to mission to tackle care imbalance. And it's also a surprise, it was also a surprise to me that only 5% of the surgeries that take place in the poorest of nations. And there is about 143 million surgeries that are really needed to cover the, to cover the gap. And this gap uh, comes in three places. There is one is uh, cancer, other is uh, road accidents from it. There is the other is cardiovascular disease. There are three places you know, where they have found a great amount of uh, um, gap. And then they said, you know, people are undi dying unnecessarily and then we need to really uh, bridge in this gap. And I'm trying to talk about uh, how we could bridge this gap. And then the whole thing stems from our uh, example, our personal example of uh, in the last uh, 25 years. If you see any developing nation, I think this graph is, uh, is my own idea, is that if you analyze a lot of things, I think I find this. You will find that anything you take, you know, whether you take railroads, roads, or uh, colleges, or education, schools, anything you take in India, you will have something called as a need. And you, there will be something called as availability. But then there is another thing what is called as a utilization. I think there is a gap at two places we have. I think this is the universe. But then if you want to fill up this first gap, I think if you take it as in, in the case of uh, trauma, the first gap can only be filled up by building up infrastructure. You need more hospitals, you need more doctors, or you need more nurses. There is capacity building. That means they are all high resource intensive. So for that you require uh, major policy changes. You need a very committed leadership. I think that's what is needed. The first gap, to fill up the first gap, it's tough. Whereas there's another gap which is called between the availability and utilization, the second gap. I personally think this is, this is usually can be covered and is usually done by awareness creation among the public and medical personnel and it's most important is the education. I think that's where you know, teaching and training can make a very great this thing. But this is low resource intensive. I think what it really requires is a commitment on our part. I think as doctors and medical persons, I think we can do this. The first gap filling is difficult, whereas the second gap filling is you know, much better and much easier. So my talk will be in this sector, I think I divide into three, that is uh, who teaches and who are the people who are going to be taught and what are you going to teach them. I think these are the three things how I would analyze this, uh, this problem. If you take a medical person, I think this has been our example. And this has been experience, not exam experience, because we have been receiving about more than 100, 120 surgeons visiting our department every year. And I also, over this period, found out what do these people do? The fellows who come 10 years back, how are they doing? Who has benefited? And how is, what, how is this, this service benefit? I found that trainees come at two, two levels. One is that our trainees are junior consultants. 
In the other level is the senior consultant of the heads of departments. I think they are the also visitors. So I think it's not fair to say that oh, the senior people can't visit, the deans can't visit. I think they also need to visit. I also have to visit. Because we have to remain students all the time. I think that's the visit. And I found that if the junior staff are visiting, I think in-house in this feeling, I think best done in the region itself. I think if uh, somebody from Indonesia or somebody from India has to train about trauma, I think it's no big deal to go to Australia or America to do this. I think what they have to do is we need to choose hospitals in India or uh, Singapore or somewhere where there is a lot of load. And where, this is because the, um, the problems that are seen are the same and the resources that are available are the same and the solutions are probably similar. I think that's fair. But here you don't really need a lot of resources. I think this is, I think that's very important. But the only thing is that we need to choose good institutions in this region and preferably they have to be high volume, high quality institutions. I think that, that's what is needed. And then our, I put an example with the research, every, our, our own experience. I'm trying to put in everything in the perspective because our own basic, our experience. There is an institute called a Research Africa. I think it's a UK-based charity which has done a wonderful work. which has been done for a few decades. They have done the plastic re reconstructive surgical um, uh, missions in Africa, Ghana. They have set up the whole thing for running it for decades. And what they did was you know, they had a fire uh, reconstructive surgery training program. The last year they spent it in Glasgow. They built. They spent the trainees spent in Canisbane Hospital in Glasgow. And for some reason, you know, they, the last two years they decided why not they spent the last year in India in Coimbatore. So they sent that last year was in Coimbatore, and they found that the patients, the, the trainees, you know, benefited a greater deal because the problems they see in Ghana are much more closely similar to what they see in Coimbatore than in Glasgow. I think that was you know, very useful. So I think this is a very pertinent point as to do. That. But whereas this whole thing is very different if you take it at the senior level. I think if you see go to senior level, if you see a heads of institution, I, I personally feel they need to go to the best of centers in the world. I think usually it will be the developed world. I think because uh, in the, you need to have to go to places where they have got a long established institution because they have got a lot of experience to go with this. But then the duration of stay which these people do has to be very, very, very few days. I think if I go to a big institution for three days, I can sense out now what we really what we really need. I think that's very important because if we go to the same institution, if I and my registrar go to the same place, if we go to Melbourne, I think what my registrar picks up is very different. He is very enamored by instruments, equipments, and all that. But whereas now I get influenced by the systems, protocols, and then the administration, I get to do. So you can go to the same place, but then two people can get different type of lessons. But to take the lessons, the number of, the amount of period that's required is very different. But I think for a younger fellow, it requires a longer time. He needs to stay for a longer time, but then I need to stay for the long So I think what we really need is that if you need to improve trauma care, I think teaching and training, I think the top people, the heads of institutions must visit the similar big institutions and they should stay for a, a short time. I think this is very important because uh, seeing is believing. I think without the uh, exposure of these important people to the big institutions, the speed of change that can happen is very, very little. Then again, I go back to our uh, example, say in the armed forces. Say we have been training the, the armed forces in microsurgery and then uh, almost all the lieutenant colonels and wing commanders at that level, we have been trained. But then they all become better. I think when they go back, they do better in their jobs, wherever they are posted, they do better. But then sometimes you know, we had uh, Air Marshal Bagel visit us. I think when the Air Marshal, uh, they visited us. But they visited only for one day, I think it was only for a few hours, but then immediately what really happened was they decided that not necessarily a plastic science had to visit this place, but then it could be for a study level of two years. Two years, a general surgeon can spend the time with us. They felt that the army or the army armed forces could benefit them. So it made a big policy changes were made because of that visit. I think that's true. Similarly, we find if the heads of an associate professors or professors visit our unit, if a trainee visits the unit, he gets better. But whereas the professor visits our unit, I find when they go back, they can institute a lot of changes in the emergency system at all. I think that's the way. The third example is that uh, the American Hand Society is what I call, it's called as a Sterling Bundle Fellow. The selection is very prestigious, and they always select people who will, may, will be the leaders in the future. I think they, he visited one of them, uh, Martin Boyer from Washington University visited us, and then he went back and created a system a fully funded uh, training program whereby all hand fellows come to our units for them. So now we have got uh, 35 fellows that come back to them. So the fellows coming and the senior people coming, I think they really make a, make a big difference. I think this is one way where we could make a big difference. I think this is a protocol we could follow. There's another way how developed nations uh, could help us in that uh, 
We need to have you know, pioneers and really top people visiting the important you know, important units. I think that's very very important because they are all quite they are all the thought leaders, and thought leaders visiting and interacting for a few days could make a make a very big difference. I think another example is that uh, Professor Kevin Chung from Michigan University he visited us and he asked me. How can American society can make a difference? How can you make a difference in the world? I told him that uh, the only one way they could make a difference is that the really top personnel of American they must travel. And usually in a middle level and moderate level travel, but then these big guys don't travel. They don't hesitate to travel to Bangladesh or Vietnam or uh, India. They don't hesitate to travel. I think those guys have to travel. And then he said, okay, let's go back. And then he told that to the American Foundation, and then they agreed. And to make it the first try, they took the first visit to India, India and Bangladesh. I think they asked me to coordinate. I think Professor Terry Light, who is a really a good person, is a past president of ASSH, visited, visited, visited last year. He visited India and India and Bangladesh. And it was extraordinarily successful. Extraordinary successful. And then if you go to their uh, foundation website, I think it has got it. And they just put up exactly what we put it as our goal of this. They said, this program can make a lasting change in the lives of many people. An academic program such as the visiting professorship allows the professor to train local people and then he say influence their thoughts and help develop future leaders. I think that's the thought. I think that's the idea. Whereas now if these people come up, with the high level people come up, and I think that that makes a big difference because they are good speakers and they are very inspirational and they have got a capacity to assess the need and also to provide the answer to the need. I think that's very important. Because, because due to their experience they can make a difference. I think that's very that's very important. The second thing is they also have got a power to make changes because people listen to them when they go back. They can influence people and their words carry weight. So now this program has become an established program in the American Foundation. I think this has become an established program. The next year they sent one to South America and they said the next year 2017 they will again make it to India and Sri Lanka. I think something now they said that they think. That. So to put it short, you know, in the training for the medical person, I think what I think is that Young trainees in the region, I think they must train in the regional hospital, but then it should be a fellowship, I think, if an EAS meets, I think we need to really catch up a funding for six months, one year, or two years, for paid fellowships. But the leaders in the region, they need to visit the best centers in the world, but very short visits. And the pioneers from the big areas, I think they must visit, visit, visit uh, India. The next question is now the taught, who is to be taught? Apart from the medical profession, I think, if we really need to make this a very big, uh, make a difference, I think we need to train nurses, transport coordinators, rehabilitation person. They all have, they also have to be have to be taught. That's very important. But then, if we have to implement this, how do we implement this? I think that again is a very big question. Because, but what is really requires is the leadership, and we need to somebody who runs this program. I think they need to take uh, ownership of this program. It's not enough if we just talk this and go. I think somebody has to really take care of the teaching programs. I think if they have to survive. I think somebody has to take a real ownership of these programs. I think that we have found. I think that then only it will have a continuity of these programs. So I think I'll give another example. Our, our uh, uh, unit's relationship with Bangladesh. Ten years back, I visited Bangladesh, and then we really said we'll train the people and reconstructive surgery. But then the question was, uh, how, who will choose the training? Because by seeing the uh, biret, I don't really choose. I can't really understand who is a good training. But if you choose a training, particularly in trauma care, more than the hard skills, I think the soft skills, the attitude is very important. I think the attitude, I can't judge it from a three, piece, three pages of paper. So I just said in the meeting, I said, I chose two persons. One is the top orthopedic surgeon and the top plastic surgeon. I said, whom sir, Professor Carey and Professor Kalam chooses, they will come, irrespective of what post they hold. But then this has been going on very well, and they have been given the responsibility, they have given the ownership of the problem. It has gone on very well. I think now we have trained about now 20 top hand signs of Bangladesh or from our place. So now we know we have ensured it, and then it goes into the very continuity of the problem is uh, continuity of the problem is ensured. The third thing is, and I totally agree with what Jalal told. Now, I think for anything that we do, I think we need to measure outcomes. I think you need data. I'm very strong. Fifteen years back, if I had this lecture, I would have told all about now this is only for Australia or America. I think it's, it's not for us. I think I would not have really taken it very seriously, but then as you grow older, I think you really feel you need hard data. Unless you have data, I think you don't really improve. This is very important. I like this very much because that which measured is improves. That which is measured and reported improves external measure. It is not that you measure it, but I think somebody else must know I think what you have measured. And then if that is, that is done, it is really not very, very good. So how do you measure this? We have also tried this in some good institutions. And what we personally feel is that 
the important thing is that you must le- link institution with shared values. I think shared values and sharing the outcome. I think that's that's very important. Aligning good institutions is the key. I think even in India, I think aligning good institutions is the key. This attitude of sharing information will greatly benefit uh, everyone. On a practical basis, if you say, okay, in Jibmer or in uh, Albany Institute, I think you how many people, people may find it very difficult to match in putting some scores and all that. But then if you have certain yardsticks and they, you match the results of between these units, and then what really happens is that the best practice will come up. I think that's, that's very, very, not that now you need to you take up some score which is reported in the West, but then you just take some point. And then what happens in your institution, what happens in us? I think if there is some gross difference, that means there must be something wrong. If somebody is doing, getting good results, that means that somebody must be doing something, it's something very good. The third thing is the thought. I think this is a lot of people. So I think we are uh, talking to the, we are trying to make an effect on all these uh, people. I think I am very, very convinced that to make a difference, we need to teach not just the medical personnel, but also the public. I think this is also told in Professor uh, uh, Mishra's talk. Uh, I am very convinced that uh, more tangible benefits can immediately be seen if public education is done. I think that's if you really take try to educate doctors, you see what what benefit you get. What is the time into gestation period to get that improvement? I think it takes time. Whereas you teach public and then what how much effort you do and what is the benefit you get? I think the benefit is very high. I think that that's very high. So giving an example, our own side when we started a uh, hand trauma. We started a project and then the, pro- the project's goal was, the purpose of the project was we had reduced the number of hand injuries. But then every injured hand must get good treatment, they must come to us. I think that was our uh, idea. So what we did was, uh, we thought of going to education. What we did was, we put in up 5,000 posters we printed. This is the poster which says, no, don't put your hand before the wheel stops. Like that, now we, we put first some nice posters. With some nice and local, well like 5,000 posters and distributed to all the industries. I got this idea of after visiting a Toyota factory in Lexington. Everywhere the safety, safety, safety was there in the Toyota factory. So after that I got this idea and then put it on. Immediately it had an effect because the injuries level really came down and a lot of uh, the owners of these institutions asked me, the doctor, can you give me some more posters? Okay, after this we have a real problem. But then I also found another thing, our uh, rate of hand injury treatment also became higher. We, are, we also received more patients. Uh, we found that every injured fellow came back to us. And then, uh, because the other thing which contained was, what do you do in the case of a hand injury? You certainly reduce hand injury, you need to keep elevate the hand, I think you need to compress, don't put nonsense, you don't put turmeric powder, this, that, all that into the wood. Then we always know, say splints, but how do you get a splint in the place where you get, even a folded, big, nowadays newspapers are very thick with advertisements, you really fold it up big and then put it on, I think that's just a good splint. So we put it on like this, we found that a lot of fellows came with the brochure and they splint like this and they came back to the hospital. So I think it became a very, very useful, uh, useful. And we also said how to bring the amputated parts because we are the leading replantation center of the region. So we also put this, I think immediately, I think the education, because we need to go down to the masses. Because they don't, after you get, uh, after you are involved in a catastrophe, you don't have time to learn. I think you need to have a pre learned if you have to come out of a catastrophe, you, you, are, you should be pre-educated. You don't have time to get educated after the, after the catastrophe. The similar thing, same thing is burns. I think in India there is a tremendous feeling if you get burnt, don't put water. So we really have to get out of the idea. I said one of the easiest, best way to uh, treat the first aid mixture for burns is to pour cold water and then keep it up. I think that's it. So here again, this thing. So the another question that is there in India is that uh, now not aid is coming up very well. Ambulance services are picking up. My personal feeling is that in about five years we'll have a good ambulance system throughout the country. I think even now the, uh, the retrieval time is very less. In a short, short time it goes. But then there are two questions to this in trauma. One is that uh, how to go. I think ambulance service will be the answer. The next question is the where to go. I think the where to go is again you know, is a very important question in India. I think that's, these people know if the cardiac means they have to go here, injury means they have to go here, they like that way. Because unless you, know, you get this, we cannot be able to make any major say. For example, here you see a chap with a pelvic injury in shock. The hand is you know, really bad. I think you really see it in close quarters in you know, a devascularized hand with a very bad uh, injury. But then if we really have to save these people, I think you really need to have a, uh, you need to come to a top center. I think the primary referral to a top center is very important. You resist a pelvic fixation, fix that test. Then you reattach the hand and there's the same boy now again. But then if we have to, this type of results to be possible, I think public and the uh, transportation personnel must be able to know, must be able to answer that question, not only how to go, but also answer the question where to go. I think that, that again is, is very important. Frequently we underestimate the 
uh, value of teaching the public. I did one, one more study. We did a study of our own hospital employees. Not the doctors and the nurses, but we, uh, we did a, our, there are a lot of people, maintenance department, uh, so many people are working in the hospital. We asked them a very simple question. We are the topmost hospital of the region uh, for burns, for trauma and all. We asked them two questions. What do you do in the first aid for burns? And the other question was, how do you bring an amputated part? 50% of the people did not know the answer. But this is in our hospital. And they, they are the people, our hospital, and our hospital is the leading hospital for these two, these two problems. So I think that to have a lasting impact, you, what you really need to do is that you need to keep on teaching the public. And amazingly, what you need to do is you need to consistently, repeatedly, you have to keep this part. I personally feel in the EAS that we can make a booklet because what to do for first aid and all will be the same whether it's Singapore or in India, it will be the same. But then we can have a, a lot of pages left now to add up the local particulars. I think that we could do. And the last part of it is the curriculum and the sharing of the ideas which reduce cost because cost is a concern. I think it's a very, very important concern. Some of us may be following certain systems which have been found beneficial. Others could learn it and innovations will be there. So these are things to learn. One of the things is that of irrigation solutions. We are a major trauma unit and then we irrigate a lot of uh, solutions to irrigate. From the very beginning, I, what I used was autoclave water was the one we used. Some people objected to that, but then I kept on using it because I found we are using about 150 bottles per day. And if you take a rough cost on a year, it's about 1.6 million is the rupees, you know, there's a cost just by irrigating water. So I said, okay, I took a bold step, but then I really found after 10 years, I found there was an answer in some journal, wound care journal, there's nothing, no, no difference between water and uh, saline. Okay, but then we are saving about this. But then you really find a lot of places that you still use saline. So you just use autoclave. Every morning you will find about 150 bottles are now uh, autoclave and kept to us for our daily use. So I think in this way, like this, so many practices would be using some uh, any other hospitals would be using. The other thing is the regional anesthesia. I think that's very important. I think if you do very, very major surgeries with regional anesthesia, we do free flaps under major anesthesia. So even in pediatrics, geriatrics, everywhere now we use regional anesthesia. I think general anesthesia, very little of general anesthesia. Only 10% of it is general anesthesia for the, for the 10,000 number of patients that we operate in our department. Only 10% go to general anesthesia. Some type of block is again cutting cost. So here again, these sort of things, we should be able to, to share between them, that and share between the units. So we have to acknowledge that although the cost of teaching and training or the effort that you take is high to achieve this, but if you are not doing it, the, it's the, the cost is going to be greater. I think we are going to suffer more if you are not going to do this. I think that's, that we have to be very convinced. I think we need to act. But I think what I have said, I, I personally feel is doable because we have done it. And they are capable of being monitored because we are monitoring it. And then they have got all of them, we have got a very measurable uh, outcomes. But what it really requires is a very committed leadership. I think somebody who will own up the problem. I think somebody who owns up a problem and then who will be able to own up any projects that are given, I think they should be able to own responsibility problem. I'm sure now with, with uh, the passion we can make a difference. I will finish off with our, uh, what our father of our nation told. That you can be the change if you, you, you be the change if you want, to, that you want to see in the world. I think that's, uh, that's very important. And uh, we have to set every institution where we work, if you make it as island of excellence, I think automatically what will happen is the peer pressure will make every other institution nearby to make it better. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Asa.